section eleven of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli the early drama it is curious to trace the first rude attempts of the drama in various nations to observe at that moment how crude is the imagination and to trace the caprices it indulges and that the resemblance in these attempts holds in the earliest essays of greece of france of spain of england and what appears extraordinary even of china and mexico the rude beginnings of the drama of greece are sufficiently known and the old mysteries of europe have been exhibited in a former article the progress of the french theatre has been this etienne jodel in fifteen fifty two seems to have been the first who had a tragedy represented of his own invention entitled cleopatra it was a servile imitation of the form of the grecian tragedy but if this did not require the highest genius it did the utmost intrepidity for the people were through long habit intoxicated with the wild amusement they amply received from their farces and moralities the following curious anecdote which followed the first attempt at classical imitation is very observable jodel's success was such that his rival poets touched by the spirit of the grecian muse showed a singular proof of their enthusiasm for this new poet in a classical festivity which gave room for no little scandal in that day yet as it was produced by a carnival it was probably a kind of drunken bout fifty poets during the carnival of fifteen fifty two went to arquille chance says the writer of the life of the old french bard rossard who was one of the present profane party threw across their road a goat which having caught they ornamented the goat with chaplets of flowers and carried it triumphantly to the hall of their festival to appear to sacrifice to bacchus and to present it to jodel for the goat among the ancients was the prize of the tragic bards the victim of bacchus who presided over tragedy carmine qui tragico willem surtawit ab hersum the goat thus adorned and his beard painted was hunted about the long table at which the fifty poets were seated and after having served them for a subject of laughter for some time he was hunted out of the room and not sacrificed to bacchus each of the guests made verses on the occasion in imitation of the bacchanalia of the ancients ronsard composed some dithyrambics to celebrate the festival of the goat of etienne jodel and another entitled our travels to arquil however this bacchanalian freak did not finish as it ought where it had begun among the poets several ecclesiastics sounded the alarm and one chandier accused ronsard with having performed an idolatrous sacrifice and it was easy to accuse the moral habits of fifty poets assembled together who were far doubtless from being irreproachable they repented for some time of their classical sacrifice of a goat to tragedy hardy the french lope de vega wrote eight hundred dramatic pieces from sixteen hundred to sixteen hundred and thirty seven his imagination was the most fertile possible but so wild and unchecked that though its extravagances are very amusing they served as so many instructive lessons to his successors one may form a notion of his violation of the unities by his piece la force du sang in the first act laocadia is carried off and ravished in the second she is sent back with an evident sign of pregnancy in the third she lies in and at the close of this act her son is about ten years old in the fourth the father of the child acknowledges him and in the fifth lamenting his son's unhappy fate he marries Leo cadia such are the pieces in the infancy of the drama rotrou 
was the first who ventured to introduce several persons in the same scene before his time they rarely exceeded two persons if a third appeared he was usually a mute actor who never joined the other two the state of the theatre was even then very rude the most lascivious embraces were publicly given and taken and rotru even ventured to introduce a naked page in the scene who in this situation holds a dialogue with one of his heroines in another piece scadasse ou l'hospitalite violet hardy makes two young spartans carry off scadasse's two daughters ravish them on the stage and violating them in the side scenes the spectators heard their cries and their complaints cardinal richelieu made the theatre one of his favourite pursuits and though not successful as a dramatic writer his encouragement of the drama gradually gave birth to genius scudery was the first to introduce the twenty-four hours from aristotle and marais studied the construction of the fable and the rules of the drama they yet groped in the dark and their beauties were yet only occasional corneille racine moliere crebillon and voltaire perfected the french drama in the infancy of the tragic art in our country the bowl and dagger were considered as the great instruments of a sublime pathos and the die all and die nobly of the exquisite and affecting tragedy of fielding were frequently realized in our popular dramas thomas gough of the university of oxford in the reign of james i was considered as no contemptible tragic poet he concludes the first part of his courageous turk by promising a second thus if this first part gentles do like you well the second part shall greater murthers tell specimens of extravagant bombast might be selected from his tragedies the following speech of amurath the turk who coming on the stage and seeing an appearance of the heavens being on fire comets and blazing stars thus addresses the heavens which seem to have been in as mad a condition as the poet's own mind how now ye heavens grow you so proud that you must needs put on curled locks and clothe yourselves in periwigs of fire in the raging turk or bejazé the second he is introduced with this most raging speech am i not emperor he that breathes a no damns in that negative syllable his soul durst any god gainsay it he should feel the strength of fiercest giants in my armies mine angers at the highest and i could shake the firm foundation of the earthly globe could i but grasp the poles in these two hands i'd pluck the world asunder he would scale heaven and when he had got beyond the utmost sphere besieged the concave of this universe and hunger starved the gods till they confessed what furies did oppress his sleeping soul these plays went through two editions the last printed in sixteen fifty six the following passage from a similar bard is as precious the king in the play exclaims by all the ancient gods of rome and greece i love my daughter better than my niece if any one should ask the reason why i tell them nature makes the stronger tie one of the rude french plays about sixteen hundred is entitled la rebellion ou mes y des grenouilles contre jupiter in five acts the subject of this tragic comic piece is nothing more than the fable of the frogs who asked jupiter for a king in the pantomimical scenes of a wild fancy the actors were seen croaking in their fens or climbing up the steep ascent of olympus they were dressed so as to appear gigantic frogs and in pleading their cause before jupiter and his court the dull humour was to croak sublimely whenever they did not agree with their judge clavigero in his curious history of mexico has given acosta's account of the mexican theatre which appears to resemble the first scenes among the greeks and these french frogs but with more fancy and taste acosta writes the small theatre was curiously whitened adorned with boughs and arches made of flowers and feathers from which were suspended many birds rabbits and other pleasing objects the actors exhibited burlesque characters feigning themselves deaf 
sick with colds lame blind crippled and addressing an idol for the return of health the deaf people answered at cross purposes those who had colds by coughing and the lame by halting all recited their complaints and misfortunes which produced infinite mirth among the audience others appeared under the names of different little animals some disguised as beetles some like toads some like lizards and upon encountering each other reciprocally explained their employments which was highly satisfactory to the people as they performed their parts with infinite ingenuity several little boys also belonging to the temple appeared in the disguise of butterflies and birds of various colours and mounting upon the trees which were fixed there on purpose little balls of earth were thrown at them with slings occasioning many humorous incidents to the spectators something very wild and original appears in this singular exhibition where at times the actors seem to have been spectators and the spectators were actors End of section 11section 12 of curiosities of literature volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org curiosities of literature volume 2 by isaac disraeli the marriage of the arts as a literary curiosity can we deny a niche to that obliquity of distorted wit of barton holliday who has composed a strange comedy in five acts performed at christ church oxford sixteen thirty not for the entertainment as an anecdote records of james the first the title of the comedy of this unclassical classic for holiday is known as the translator of juvenal with a very learned commentary is tex notamia or the marriage of the arts sixteen thirty quarto extremely dull excessively rare and extraordinarily high priced among collectors it may be exhibited as one of the most extravagant inventions of a pedant who but a pedant could have conceived the dull fancy of forming a comedy of five acts on the subject of marrying the arts they are the dramatis personae of this piece and the bachelor of arts describes their intrigues and characters his actors are polites a magistrate physica astronomia daughter to physica ethicus an old man geographus a traveller and courtier in love with astronomia arithmetica in love with geometries logicus grammaticus a schoolmaster poeta historia in love with poeta rhetorica in love with logicus melancholico poeta's man phantastes servant to geographus collar grammaticus's man all these refined and abstract ladies and gentlemen have as bodily feelings and employ as gross language as if they had been everyday characters a specimen of his grotesque dullness may entertain fruits of dull heat and suiterkins of wit geographus opens the play with declaring his passion to astronomia and that very rudely indeed see the pedant wreathing the roses of love geographus come now you shall astronomia astronomia what shall i geographus geographus kiss astronomia what in spite of my teeth geographus no not so i hope you do not use to kiss with your teeth astronomia mary and i hope i do not use to kiss without them geographus ay but my fine wit-catcher i mean you do not show your teeth when you kiss he then kisses her as he says in the different manners of a french spanish and dutch kiss he wants to take off the zone of astronomia she begs he would not fondle her like an elephant as he is and geographus says again won't you then astronomia won't i what geographus be kind astronomia be kind how fortunately geographus is here interrupted by astronomia's mother physica this dialogue is a specimen 
of the whole piece very flat and very gross yet the piece is still curious not only for its absurdity but for that sort of ingenuity which so whimsically contrived to bring together the different arts this pedantic writer however owes more to the subject than the subject derived from him without wit or humour he has at times an extravagance of invention as for instance geographus and his man phantastes describe to poeta the lying wonders they pretend to have witnessed and this is one phantastic sir we met with a traveller that could speak six languages at the same instant poeta how at the same instant that's impossible phantastes nay sir the actuality of the performance puts it beyond all contradiction with his tongue he'd so vow you out as smooth italian as any man breathing with his eye he would sparkle forth the proud spanish with his nose blow out most robustious dutch the creaking of his high-heeled shoe would articulate exact polonian the knocking of his shin-bone feminine french and his belly would grumble most pure and scholar-like hungary this though extravagant without fancy is not the worst part of the absurd humour which runs through this pedantic comedy the classical reader may perhaps be amused by the following strange conceits poeta who was in love with historia capriciously falls in love with astronomia and thus compares his mistress her brow is like a brave heroic line that does a sacred majesty enshrine her nose falusiake like in comely sort ends in a troche or a long and short her mouth is like a pretty dimeter her eyebrows like a little longer trimeter her chin is an adonike and her tongue is an hypermeter somewhat too long her eyes i may compare them unto two quick-turning dactyls for their nimble view her ribs like staves of sapphics do descend thither which but to name were to offend her arms like two iambics raised on high do with her brow bear equal majesty her legs like two straight spondees keep a pace slow as two skazans but with stately grace the piece concludes with a speech by polites who settles all the disputes and loves of the arts poeta promises for the future to attach himself to historia rhetorica though she loves logicus yet as they do not mutually agree she is united to grammaticus polites counsels phlegmatico who is logicus's man to leave off smoking and to learn better manners and collar grammaticus's man to bridle himself that ethicus and economon would vouchsafe to give good advice to poeta and historia and physica to her children geographus and astronomia for grammaticus and rhetorica he says their tongues will always agree and will not fall out and for geometries and arithmetica they will be very regular melancholico who is poeta's man is left quite alone and agrees to be married to musica and at length phantastes by the entreaty of poeta becomes a servant of melancholico and musica physiognomus and chiromantes who are in the character of gypsies and fortune-tellers are finally exiled from the island of fortunata where lies the whole scene of the action and the residence of the married arts the pedant comic writer has even attended to the dresses of his characters which are minutely given thus melancholico wears a black suit a black hat a black cloak and black work band black gloves and black shoes sanguis the servant of medicus is in a red suit on the breast is a man with his nose bleeding on the back one letting blood in his arm with a red hat and band red stockings and red pumps it is recorded of this play that the oxford scholars resolving to give james the first a relish of their genius requested leave to act this notable piece honest anthony wood tells us that it being too grave for the king and too scholastic for the auditory or as some have said the actors had taken too much wine his majesty offered several times after two acts to withdraw he was prevailed to sit it out in mere charity to the oxford scholars the following humorous epigram was produced on the occasion at christ church marriage done before the king lest that those mates should want an offering the king himself did offer what i pray he offered twice or thrice to go away End of section twelve.
Section 13 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2, by Isaac Disraeli. A Contrivance in Dramatic Dialogue. Crown in his city politiques sixteen eighty eight a comedy written to satirize the whigs of those days was accused of having copied his character too closely after life and his enemies turned his comedy into a libel he has defended himself in his preface from this imputation it was particularly laid to his charge that in the characters of bartoline an old corrupt lawyer and his wife lucinda a wanton country girl he intended to ridicule a certain Sergeant M. and his young wife. It was even said that the comedian mimicked the odd speech of the aforesaid sergeant, who, having lost all his teeth, uttered his words in a very peculiar manner. On this, Crown tells us in his defense that the comedian must not be blamed for this peculiarity, as it was an invention of the author himself who had taught it to the player he seems to have considered it as no ordinary invention and was so pleased with it that he has most painfully printed the speeches of the lawyer in this singular gibberish and his reasons as well as his discovery appear remarkable he says that not any one old man more than another is mimicked by mr lee's way of speaking which all comedians can witness was my own invention and mr lee was taught it by me to prove this farther, I have printed Bartoline's part in that manner of spelling by which I taught it Mr. Lee. They who have no teeth cannot pronounce many letters plain, but perpetually lisp and break their words, and some words they cannot bring out at all. As, for instance, v is pronounced by thrusting the tongue hard to the teeth, therefore that sound they cannot make, but something like it for that reason you will often find in bartoline's part instead of v ya as yat for that yish for this yoj for those and sometimes a t is left out as housand for thousand hurdy for thirty s they pronounce like sh as sure for sir musht for must t they speak like ch therefore you will find true for true treason for treason cho for two chu for two chen for ten chake for take and this ch is not to be pronounced as k as tis in christian but as in child church chest I desire the reader to observe these things, because otherwise he will hardly understand much of the lawyer's part, which in the opinion of all is the most divertising in the comedy, but when this ridiculous way of speaking is familiar with him, it will render the part more pleasant. One hardly expects so curious a piece of orthopy in the preface to a comedy. It may have required great observation and ingenuity to have discovered the cause of old toothless men mumbling their words, but as a piece of comic humor, on which the author appears to have prided himself, the effect is far from fortunate. Humor arising from a personal defect is but a miserable substitute for that of a more genuine kind. I shall give a specimen of this strange gibberish as it is so laboriously printed. It may amuse the reader to see his mother's language transformed into so odd a shape that it is with difficulty he can recognize it. Old Bartoline thus speaks. I wronged my shelf. Cho enter in chubange of marriage and could not perform covenant. I might well shank. You would shake the forfeiture of the bond, and I never found equity in a bench in my life but i'll trounce you both i have paved jails with the bones of honester people yin you are yet never did nor any man me wrong but had law of year side and right o year side but because ye had not me on year side 
I have thrown them in jails and got your estates for my clients yet had no more title to them yen dogs. End of section 13. Section 14 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2, by Isaac Disraeli. The Comedy of a Madman. Desmarais, the friend of Richelieu, was a very extraordinary character and produced many effusions of genius in early life till he became a mystical fanatic it was said of him that he was the greatest madman among poets and the best poet among madmen his comedy of the visionaries is one of the most extraordinary dramatic projects and in respect to its genius and its lunacy may be considered as a literary curiosity in this singular comedy all bedlam seems to be let loose on the stage and every character has a high claim to an apartment in it it is indeed suspected that the cardinal had a hand in this anomalous drama and in spite of its extravagance it was favourably received by the public who certainly had never seen anything like it every character in this piece acts under some hallucination of the mind or a fit of madness artabaz is a cowardly hero who believes he has conquered the world amidor is a wild poet who imagines he ranks above homer philidon is a lover who becomes inflammable as gunpowder for every mistress he reads of in romances phalante is a beggarly bankrupt who thinks himself as rich as croesus melis in reading the history of alexander has become madly in love with this hero and will have no other husband than him of macedon Esperi imagines her fatal charms occasion a hundred disappointments in the world but prides herself on her perfect insensibility. Sestian, who knows no other happiness than comedies, and whatever she sees or hears, immediately plans a scene for dramatic effect, renounces any other occupation. And finally, Alcidon, the father of these three mad girls, as imbecile as his daughters are wild. So much for the amiable characters. The plot is in perfect harmony with the genius of the author and the characters he has invented perfectly unconnected and fancifully wild alcidon resolves to marry his three daughters who however have no such project of their own he offers them to the first who comes he accepts for his son-in-law the first who offers and is clearly convinced that he is within a very short period of accomplishing his wishes as the four ridiculous personages whom we have noticed frequently haunt his house he becomes embarrassed in finding one lover too many having only three daughters the catastrophe relieves the old gentleman from his embarrassments melis faithful to her macedonian hero declares her resolution of dying before she marries any meaner personage esperi refuses to marry out of pity for mankind for to make one man happy she thinks she must plunge a hundred into despair sestian only passionate for comedy cannot consent to any marriage and tells her father in very lively verses je ne veux point mon père épouser un censeur puisque vous me souffrez recevoir la douceur des plaisirs innocents que le théâtre apporte prendrais je le hasard de vivre d'autres sortes puis on a des enfants qui vous sont sur les bras les mener en théâtre oh dieu quel embarras tantôt couche ou grossesse ou quelque maladie pour jamais vous font dire adieu la comédie imitated no no my father i will have no critic miscalled a husband since you still permit the innocent sweet pleasures of the stage and shall i venture to exchange my lot then we have children folded in our arms to bring them to the playhouse heavens what troubles then we lie in are big or sick or vexed these make us bid farewell to comedy at length these imagined sons-in-law appear philidon declares that in these three girls he cannot find the mistress he adores Amidor confesses he only asked for one of his daughters out of pure gallantry, and that he is only a lover in verse. When Falande is questioned after the great fortunes he hinted at, the father discovers that he has not a stiver, and out of credit to borrow. 
while artabas declares that he only allowed alcidon out of mere benevolence to flatter himself for a moment with the hope of an honour that even jupiter would not dare to pretend to the four lovers disperse and leave the old gentleman more embarrassed than ever and his daughters perfectly enchanted to enjoy their whimsical reveries and die old maids all alike visionaries end of section fourteen Section 15 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2 by Isaac Disraeli. Solitude we possess among our own native treasures two treatises on this subject composed with no ordinary talent and not their least value consists in one being an apology for solitude while the other combats that prevailing passion of the studious zimmerman's popular work is overloaded with commonplace the garrulity of eloquence the two treatises now noticed may be compared to the highly finished gems whose figure may be more finely designed and whose strokes may be more delicate in the smaller space they occupy than the ponderous block of marble hewed out by the german chiseller sir george mackenzie a polite writer and a most eloquent pleader published in sixteen sixty five a moral essay preferring solitude to public employment the eloquence of his style was well suited to the dignity of his subject the advocates for solitude have always prevailed over those for active life because there is something sublime in those feelings which would retire from the circle of indolent triflers or depraved geniuses the tract of mackenzie was ingeniously answered by the elegant taste of john evelyn in sixteen sixty seven mackenzie though he wrote in favour of solitude passed a very active life first as a pleader and afterwards as a judge that he was an eloquent writer and an eloquent critic we have the authority of dryden who says that till he was acquainted with that noble wit of scotland sir george mackenzie he had not known the beautiful turn of words and thoughts in poetry which sir george had explained and exemplified to him in conversation as a judge and king's advocate will not the barbarous customs of the age defend his name he is most hideously painted forth by the dark pencil of a poetical spagnoletti graham in his poem on the birds of scotland sir george lived in the age of rebellion and used torture we must entirely put aside his political to attend to his literary character blair has quoted his pleadings as a model of eloquence and graham is unjust to the fame of mackenzie when he alludes to his half-forgotten name in sixteen eighty nine he retired to oxford to indulge the luxuries of study in the bodleian library and to practise that solitude which so delighted him in theory but three years afterwards he fixed himself in london evelyn who wrote in favour of public employment being preferable to solitude passed his days in the tranquillity of his studies and wrote against the habits which he himself most loved by this it may appear that that of which we have the least experience ourselves will ever be what appears most delightful alas everything in life seems to have in it the nature of a bubble of air and when touched we find nothing but emptiness in our hand it is certain that the most eloquent writers in favour of solitude have left behind them too many memorials of their unhappy feelings when they indulge this passion to excess and some ancient has justly said that none but a god or a savage can suffer this exile from human nature the following extracts from sir george mackenzie's tract on solitude are eloquent and impressive and merit to be rescued from that oblivion which surrounds many writers whose genius has not been effaced but concealed by the transient crowd of their posterity i have admired to see persons of virtue and humour long much to be in the city where when they come they found nor sought for no other divertissement than to visit one another and there to do nothing else than to make legs view others habit 
talk of the weather or some such pitiful subject and it may be if they made a farther inroad upon any other affair they did so pick one another that it afforded them matter of eternal quarrel for what was at first but an indifferent subject is by interest adopted into the number of our quarrels what pleasure can be received by talking of new fashions buying and selling of lands advancement or ruin of favourites victories or defeats of strange princes which is the ordinary subject of ordinary conversation most desire to frequent their superiors and these men must either suffer their raillery or must not be suffered to continue in their society if we converse with them who speak with more address than ourselves then we repine equally at our own dullness and envy the acuteness that accomplishes the speaker or if we converse with duller animals than ourselves then we are weary to draw the yoke alone and fret at our being in ill company but if chance blows us in amongst our equals then we are so at guard to catch all advantages and so interested in point d'honneur that it rather cruciates than recreates us how many make themselves cheap by these occasions whom we had valued highly if they had frequented us less and how many frequent persons who laugh at that simplicity which the addresser admires in himself as wit and yet both recreate themselves with double laughters in solitude he addresses his friend my dear salador enter into your own breast and there survey the several operations of your own soul the progress of your passions the strugglings of your appetite the wanderings of your fancy and ye will find i assure you more variety in that one piece than there is to be learned in all the courts of christendom represent to yourself the last age all the actions and interests in it how much this person was infatuated with zeal that person with lust how much one pursued honour and another riches and in the next thought draw that scene and represent them all turned to dust and ashes i cannot close this subject without the addition of some anecdotes which may be useful a man of letters finds solitude necessary and for him solitude has its pleasures and its conveniences but we shall find that it also has a hundred things to be dreaded solitude is indispensable for literary pursuits no considerable work has yet been composed but its author like an ancient magician retired first to the grove or the closet to invocate his spirits every production of genius must be the production of enthusiasm when the youth sighs and languishes and feels himself among crowds in an irksome solitude that is the moment to fly into seclusion and meditation where can he indulge but in solitude the fine romances of his soul where but in solitude can he occupy himself in useful dreams by night and when the morning rises fly without interruption to his unfinished labours retirement to the frivolous is a vast desert to the man of genius it is the enchanted garden of armida cicero was uneasy amidst applauding rome and he has designated his numerous works by the titles of his various villas where they were composed voltaire had talents and a taste for society yet he not only withdrew by intervals but at one period of his life passed five years in the most secret seclusion and fervent studies montesquieu quitted the brilliant circles of paris for his books his meditations and for his immortal work and was ridiculed by the gay triflers he relinquished harrington to compose his oceana severed himself from the society of his friends and was so wrapped in abstraction that he was pitied as a lunatic descartes inflamed by genius abruptly breaks off all his friendly connections hires an obscure house in an unfrequented corner at paris and applies himself to study during two years unknown to his acquaintance adam smith after the publication of his first work throws himself into a retirement that lasted ten years even hume rallied him for separating himself from the world but the great political inquirer satisfied the world and his friends by his great work on the wealth of nations but this solitude at first a necessity and then a pleasure at length is not born without repining i will call for a witness a great genius and he shall speak himself gibbon says i feel 
and shall continue to feel that domestic solitude however it may be alleviated by the world by study and even by friendship is a comfortless state which will grow more painful as i descend in the vale of years and afterwards he writes to a friend your visit has only served to remind me that man however amused and occupied in his closet was not made to live alone i must therefore now sketch a different picture of literary solitude than some sanguine and youthful minds conceive even the sublimest of men milton who is not apt to vent complaints appears to have felt this irksome period of life in the preface to Smek tim newis he says it is but justice not to defraud of due esteem the wearisome labours and studious watchings wherein i have spent and tired out almost a whole youth solitude in a later period of life or rather the neglect which awaits the solitary man is felt with acuter sensibility cowley that enthusiast for rural seclusion in his retirement calls himself the melancholy cowley mason has truly transferred the same epithet to gray read in his letters the history of solitude we lament the loss of cowley's correspondence through the mistaken notion of spratt he assuredly had painted the sorrows of his heart but shenstone has filled his pages with the cries of an amiable being whose soul bleeds in the dead oblivion of solitude listen to his melancholy expressions now i am come from a visit every little uneasiness is sufficient to introduce my whole train of melancholy considerations and to make me utterly dissatisfied with the life i now lead and the life i foresee i shall lead i am angry and envious and dejected and frantic and disregard all present things as becomes a madman to do i am infinitely pleased though it is a gloomy joy with the application of dr swift's complaint that he is forced to die in a rage like a poisoned rat in a hole let the lover of solitude muse on its picture throughout the year in the following stanza by the same poet tedious again to curse the drizzling day again to trace the wintry tracks of snow or soothed by vernal airs again survey the self-same hawthorn's bud and cowslips blow swift's letters paint in terrifying colours a picture of solitude and at length his despair closed with idiotism the amiable gresset could not sport with the brilliant wings of his butterfly muse without dropping some querulous expression on the solitude of genius in his epistle to his muse he exquisitely paints the situation of men of genius je les vois victimes du génie au foible prix d'un éclat passager vivre insolé sans jouir de la vie and afterwards he adds vingt ans dont oui pour quelques jours de gloire i conclude with one more anecdote on solitude which may amuse the menage attacked by some and abandoned by others was seized by a fit of the spleen he retreated into the country and gave up his famous mercurialis those wednesdays when the literati assembled at his house to praise up or cry down one another as is usual with the literary populace menage expected to find that tranquillity in the country which he had frequently described in his verses but as he was only a poetical plagiarist it is not strange that our pastoral writer was greatly disappointed some country rogues having killed his pigeons they gave him more vexation than his critics he hastened his return to paris it is better he observed since we are born to suffer to feel only reasonable sorrows End of section fifteen section sixteen of curiosities of literature volume two this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2, by Isaac Disraeli. Literary Friendships The memorable friendship of Beaumont and Fletcher so closely united their labors that we cannot discover the productions of either and biographers cannot without difficulty compose the memoirs of the one without running into the life of the other they portrayed the same characters while they mingled sentiment with sentiment and their days were as closely interwoven as their verses 
metastasio and farinelli were born about the same time and early acquainted they called one another gemello or the twin both the delight of europe both lived to an advanced age and died nearly at the same time their fortune bore too a resemblance for they were both pensioned but lived and died separated in the distant courts of vienna and madrid montaigne and charon were rivals but always friends such was montaigne's affection for charon that he permitted him by his will to bear the full arms of his family and charon evinced his gratitude to the manes of his departed friend by leaving his fortune to the sister of montaigne who had married forty years of friendship uninterrupted by rivalry or envy crowned the lives of poggius and leonard areton two of the illustrious revivers of letters a singular custom formerly prevailed among our own writers which was an affectionate tribute to our literary veterans by young writers the former adopted the latter by the title of sons ben jonson had twelve of these poetical sons walton the angler adopted cotton the translator of montaigne among the most fascinating effusions of genius are those little pieces which it consecrates to the cause of friendship in that poem of cowley composed on the death of his friend harvey the following stanza presents a pleasing picture of the employments of two young students say for you saw us ye immortal lights how oft unwearied have we spent the nights till the laden stars so famed for love wondered at us from above we spent them not in toys in lust or wine but search of deep philosophy wit eloquence and poetry arts which i loved for they my friend were thine milton has not only given the exquisite lycidas to the memory of a young friend but in his epitaphium demonis to that of deodatus has poured forth some interesting sentiments it has been versified by langhorne now says the poet to whom shall i my hopes and fears impart or trust the cares and follies of my heart the elegy of tickle maliciously called by steel prose in rhyme is alike inspired by affection and fancy it has a melodious languor and a melancholy grace the sonnet of gray to the memory of west is a beautiful effusion and a model for english sonnets helvetius was the protector of men of genius whom he assisted not only with his criticism but his fortune at his death sorin read in the french academy an epistle to the manes of his friend Sorin, wrestling with obscurity and poverty, had been drawn into literary existence by the supporting hand of Helvetius. Our poet thus addresses him in the warm tones of gratitude. C'est toi qui me cherchant au sein de l'infortune releva mon sort abattu, et su me rendre cher une vie importune. Qu'importe ces pleurs, aux douleurs impuissantes, aux regrets superflus, je vis, hélas je vis et mon ami n'est plus imitated in misery's haunts thy friend thy bounty sees and give an urgent life some days of ease ah ye vain griefs superfluous tears i chide i live alas i live and thou hast died the literary friendship of a father with his son is one of the rarest alliances in the republic of letters it was gratifying to the feelings of young Gibbon, in the fervor of literary ambition, to dedicate his first fruits to his father. The too lively son of Crebillon, though his was a very different genius to the grandeur of his father's, yet dedicated his works to him, and for a moment put aside his wit and raillery for the pathetic expressions of filial veneration. We have had a remarkable instance in the two Richardsons, and the father, in his original manner, has in the most glowing language expressed his affectionate sentiments. He says, My time of learning was employed in business, but after all, I have the Greek and Latin tongues, because a part of me possesses them, to whom I can recur at pleasure, just as I have a hand, when I would write or paint, feet to walk and eyes to see. My son is of my learning, as I am that to him which he has not. We make one man, and such a compound man may probably produce what no single man can. And further, I always think it my peculiar happiness to be, as it were, enlarged, expanded, made another man by the acquisition of my son, and he thinks in the same manner concerning my union with him. This is as curious as it is uncommon, however the cynic may call it egotism. Some, for their friend, have died penetrated with inconsolable grief. Some have sacrificed their character to preserve his own, some have shared their limited fortune, and some have remained attached to their friend in the cold season of adversity. Jurieu denounced Bale as an impious writer, and drew his conclusions from the avis aux réfugiés. 
This work is written against the Calvinists, and therefore becomes impious in Holland. Bale might have exculpated himself with facility by declaring the work was composed by La Roque, but he preferred to be persecuted rather than to ruin his friend. He therefore was silent and was condemned. When the minister Fouquet was abandoned by all, it was the men of letters he had patronized who never forsook his prison, and many have dedicated their works to great men in their adversity, whom they scorned to notice at the time when they were noticed by all. The learned Goguet bequeathed his manuscripts and library to his friend Fugère, with whom he had united his affections and his studies. His work on the origin of the arts and sciences had been much indebted to his aid. Fugère, who knew his friend to be past recovery, preserved a mute despair during the slow and painful disease, and on the death of Goguet, the victim of sensibility perished amidst the manuscripts which his friend had in vain bequeathed to prepare for publication. The Abbé de Saint-Pierre gave an interesting proof of literary friendship. When he was at college, he formed a union with Varignon the geometrician. They were of congenial dispositions. When he went to Paris, he invited Varignon to accompany him, but Varignon had nothing, and the abbé was far from rich. A certain income was necessary for the tranquil pursuits of geometry. Our abbé had an income of eighteen hundred livres. From this he deducted three hundred which he gave to the geometrician, accompanied by a delicacy which few but a man of genius could conceive. "'I do not give it to you,' he said, as a salary, but an annuity, that you may be independent and quit me when you dislike me. Something nearly similar embellishes our own literary history. When Akenside was in great danger of experiencing famine as well as fame, Mr. Dyson allowed him three hundred pounds a year. Of this gentleman, perhaps, nothing is known, yet whatever his life may be, it merits the tribute of the biographer. To close with these honorable testimonies of literary friendship, we must not omit that of Churchill and Lloyd. It is known that when Lloyd heard of the death of our poet, he acted the part which Fugère did to Goguet. The page is crowded, but my facts are by no means exhausted. The most illustrious of the ancients prefixed the name of some friend to the head of their works. We too often place that of some patron. They honorably inserted it in their works. When a man of genius, however, shows that he is not less mindful of his social affection than his fame, he is the more loved by his reader. Plato communicated a ray of his glory to his brothers, for in his Republic he ascribed some parts to Adamanthus and Glaucon and Antiphon, the youngest, is made to deliver his sentiments in the Parmenides. To perpetuate the fondness of friendship, several authors have entitled their works by the name of some cherished associate. Cicero, to his treatise on orators, gave the title of Brutus, to that of friendship, Lelius, and to that of old age, Cato. They have been imitated by the moderns. The poetical Tasso, to his dialogue on friendship, gave the name of Manso, who was afterwards his affectionate biographer. Sepulveda entitles his treatise on glory by the name of his friend Gonsalves. Lociel, to his dialogues on the lawyers of Paris, prefixes the name of the learned Pasquier. Thus, Plato distinguishes his dialogues by the names of certain persons. The one on lying is entitled Hippias, on rhetoric Gorgias, and on beauty Phaedrus. Luther has perhaps carried this feeling to an extravagant point. He was so delighted by his favorite commentary on the Epistle to the Galatians that he distinguished it by a title of doting fondness. He named it after his wife and called it his Catherine. End of section 16「Section 17 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2, by Isaac Disraeli. Anecdotes of Abstraction of Mind Some have exercised this power of abstraction to a degree that appears marvellous to volatile spirits and puny thinkers. To this patient habit, Newton is indebted for many of his great discoveries, an apple falls upon him in his orchard and the system of attraction succeeds in his mind he observes boys blowing soap bubbles and the properties of light display themselves of socrates it is said that he would frequently remain an entire day and night in the same attitude absorbed in meditation and why should we doubt this when we know that la fontaine and thomson descartes and newton experienced the same abstraction 
Mercato, the celebrated geographer, found such delight in the ceaseless progression of his studies that he would never willingly quit his maps to take the necessary refreshments of life. In Cicero's treatise on old age, Cato applauds scholars, who, when he sat down to write in the morning, was surprised by the evening, and when he took up his pen in the evening, was surprised by the appearance of the morning. Buffon once described these delicious moments with his accustomed eloquence. Invention depends on patience. Contemplate your subject long. It will gradually unfold, till a sort of electric spark convulses for a moment the brain, and spreads down to the very heart a glow of irritation. Then come the luxuries of genius, the true hours for production and composition, hours so delightful that I have spent twelve and fourteen successively at my writing-desk, and still been in a state of pleasure. The anecdote related of Marini, the Italian poet, may be true. Once absorbed in revising his Adonis, he suffered his leg to be burned for some time without any sensation. Abstraction of this sublime kind is the first step to that noble enthusiasm which accompanies genius. It produces those raptures and that intense delight which some curious facts will explain to us. Podgers relates of Dante that he indulged his meditations more strongly than any man he knew. Whenever he read, he was only alive to what was passing in his mind. To all human concerns, he was as if they had not been. Dante went one day to a great public procession. He entered the shop of a bookseller to be a spectator of the passing show. He found a book which greatly interested him. He devoured it in silence and plunged into an abyss of thought. On his return, he declared that he had neither seen nor heard the slightest occurrence of the public exhibition which had passed before him. This enthusiasm renders everything surrounding us as distant as if an immense interval separated us from the scene. A modern astronomer, one summer night, withdrew to his chamber. The brightness of the heaven showed the phenomenon. He passed the whole night in observing it, and when they came to him early in the morning and found him in the same attitude, he said, like one who had been recollecting his thoughts for a few moments, It must be thus, but I'll go to bed before tis late. He had gazed the entire night in meditation and did not know it. This intense abstraction operates visibly. This perturbation of the faculties, as might be supposed, affects persons of genius physically. What a forcible description the late Madame Roland, who certainly was a woman of the first genius, gives of herself on her first reading of Telemachus and Tasso. My respiration rose, I felt a rapid fire colouring my face, and my voice changing had betrayed my agitation. I was Eucharis for Telemachus, and Erminia for Tancred. However, during this perfect transformation, I did not yet think that I myself was anything for anyone. The whole had no connection with myself. I sought for nothing around me. I was them. I saw only the objects which existed for them. It was a dream without being awakened. Metastasio describes a similar situation. When I apply with a little attention, the nerves of my sensorium are put into a violent tumult. I grow as red in the face as a drunkard, and am obliged to quit my work. When Malbranche first took up Descartes on man, the German origin of his philosophy, he was obliged frequently to interrupt his reading by a violent palpitation of the heart. When the first idea of the essay on the arts and sciences rushed on the mind of Rousseau, it occasioned such a feverish agitation that it approached to a delirium. This delicious inebriation of the imagination occasioned the ancients, who sometimes perceived the effects, to believe it was not short of divine inspiration. Fielding says, I do not doubt but that the most pathetic and affecting scenes have been writ with tears. He perhaps would have been pleased to have confirmed his observation by the following circumstances. The tremors of Dryden, after having written an ode, a circumstance tradition has accidentally handed down, were not unusual with him. In the preface to his tales, he tells us that in translating Homer he found greater pleasure than in Virgil, but it was not a pleasure without pain. The continual agitation of the spirits must needs be a weakener to any constitution, especially in age and many pauses are required for refreshment betwixt the heats. In writing the ninth scene of the second act of the Olympiad, Metastasio found himself in tears, an effect which afterwards, says Dr. Burney, proved very contagious. 
it was on this occasion that that tender poet commemorated the circumstance in the following interesting sonnet sonnet from metastasio scrivendo l'autore in vienna l'anno 1733 la sua olimpiade si senti comosa fino alle lacrime nell'esprimere la divisione di due teneri amici e meravigliandosi che un falso e da lui inventato disastro potesse cagionargli una sì vera passione si fece a riflettere quanto poco ragionevole e solido fondamento possano aver le altre che solion frequentemente agitaci nel corso di nostra vita sogni e favole io fingo eppure in carte mentre favole e sogni orno e disegno in lor folle ch'io son prendo tal parte che del mal che inventai piango e mi sdegno ma forse allor che non m'inganna l'arte più saggio io sono e l'agitato ingegno forse allo più tranquillo o forse parte da più salda cagion l'amor lo sdegno a che non sol quelle ch'io canto o scrivo favole son ma quanto temo o spero tutte manzogna e delirando io vivo sogno della mia vita e il corso intero de tu signor quando ad estar mi arrivo fa ch'io trovi riposo in sen del vero in seventeen thirty three the author composing his olympiad felt himself suddenly moved even to tears in expressing the separation of two tender lovers surprised that a fictitious grief invented too by himself could raise so true a passion he reflected how little reasonable and solid a foundation the others had which so frequently agitated us in this state of our existence sonnet imitated fables and dreams i feign yet though but verse the dreams and fables that adorn this scroll fond fool i rave and grieve as i rehearse while genuine tears for fancied sorrows roll perhaps the dear delusion of my heart is wisdom and the agitated mind as still responding to each plaintive part with love and rage a tranquil hour can find ah not alone the tender rhymes i give are fictions but my fears and hopes i deem are fables all deliriously i live and life's whole course is one protracted dream eternal power when shall i wake to rest this wearied brain on truth's immortal breast end of section seventeen section eighteen of curiosities of literature volume two this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2, by Isaac Desraeli. Richardson the censure which the shakespeare of novelists has incurred for the tedious procrastination in the minute details of his fable his slow unfolding characters and the slightest gestures of his personages is extremely unjust for it is not evident that we could not have his peculiar excellences without these accompanying defects when characters are fully delineated the narrative must be suspended whenever the narrative is rapid which so much delights superficial readers the characters cannot be very minutely featured and the writer who aims to instruct as richardson avowedly did by the glow and eloquence of his feelings must often sacrifice to this his local descriptions richardson himself has given us the principle that guided him in composing he tells us Quote, if i give speeches and conversations i ought to give them justly for the humours and characters of persons cannot be known unless i repeat what they say and their manner of saying End quote. foreign critics have been more just to richardson than many of his own countrymen i shall notice the opinions of three celebrated writers d'alembert rousseau 
and Diderot. D'Alembert was a great mathematician. His literary taste was extremely cold. He was not worthy of reading Richardson. The volumes, if he ever read them, must have fallen from his hands. The delicate and subtle turnings, those folds of the human heart, which require so nice a touch, was a problem which the mathematician could never solve. There is no other de there is no other demonstration in the human heart but an appeal to its feelings, and what are the calculating feelings of an arithmetician of lines and curves? He therefore declared of Richardson that quote, le nature en bon en imite, ma non pas jusqu'à l'on ami. But thus it was not with the other two congenial geniuses. The fervent opinion of Rousseau must be familiar to the reader, but Diderot, in his éloge on Richardson, exceeds even Rousseau in the enthusiasm of his feelings. I extract some of the most interesting passages. Of Clarissa he says, quote, I yet remember with delight the first time it came into my hands. I was in the country. How deliciously was I affected! At every moment I saw my happiness abridged by a page, and then experienced the same sensations those feel who have long lived with one they love, and are on the point of separation. At the close of the work, I seem to remain deserted. End quote. The impassioned Diderot then breaks forth, quote, O Richardson, thou singular genius in my eyes, thou shalt form my reading in all times. If forced by sharp necessity, my friend falls into indigence. If the mediocrity of my fortune is not sufficient to bestow upon my children the necessary cares for their education, I will sell my books, but thou shalt remain. Yes, thou shalt rest in the same class with Moses, Homer, Euripides, and Sophocles, to be read alternately. O Richardson, I dare pronounce that the most veritable history is full of fictions, and thy romances are full of truths. History paints some individuals, thou paintest the human species. History attributes to some individuals what they have neither said nor done. All that thou attributest to man he has said and done. History embraces but a portion of duration, a point on the surface of the globe. Thou hast embraced all places and all times. The human heart, which has ever been and ever shall be the same, is the model which thou copiest. If we were severely to criticize the best historian, would he maintain his ground as thou? In this point of view, I venture to say that frequently history is a miserable romance, and romance, as thou hast composed it, is a good history. Painter of nature, thou never liest. I have never yet met with a person who shared my enthusiasm, that I was not tempted to embrace and to press him in my arms. Richardson is no more. His loss touches me, as if my brother was no more. I bore him in my heart without having seen him, and knowing him but by his works. He has not had all the reputation he merited. Richardson, if living thy merit has been disputed, how great wilt thou appear to our children's children, when we shall view thee at the distance we now view Homer? then who will dare to steal a line from thy sublime works? Thou hast had more admirers amongst us than in thine own country, and at this I rejoice. End quote. It is probable that to a Frenchman the style of Richardson is not so objectionable when translated as to ourselves. I think myself that it is very idiomatic and energetic. Others have thought differently. The misfortune of Richardson was that he was unskillful in the art of writing, and that he could never lay the pen down while his ink-horn supplied it. He was delighted by his own works. No author enjoyed so much the bliss of excessive fondness. I heard from the late Charlotte Lennox the anecdote which so severely reprimanded his innocent vanity, which Boswell has recorded. 
the lady was a regular visitor at richardson's house and she could scarcely recollect one visit which was not taxed by our author reading one of his voluminous letters or two or three if his auditor was quiet and friendly the extreme delight which he felt on a review of his own works the works themselves witness each is an evidence of what some will deem a violent literary vanity to pamela is prefixed a letter from the editor whom we know to be the author consisting of one of the most minutely labored panegyrics of the work itself that ever the blindest idolater of some ancient classic paid to the object of his frenetic imagination in several places there he contrives to repeat the striking parts of the narrative which display the fertility of his imagination to great advantage to the author's own edition of his clarissa is appended an alphabetical arrangement of the sentiments dispersed throughout the work and such was the fondness that dictated this voluminous arrangement such trivial aphorisms as quote, habits are not easily changed men are known by their companions etc End quote. seem alike to be the object of their author's admiration this collection of sentiments said indeed to have been sent to him anonymously is curious and useful and shows the value of the work by the extensive grasp of that mind which could think so justly on such numerous topics and in his third and final labor to each volume of sir charles grandison is not only prefixed a complete index with as much exactness as if it were a history of england but there is also appended a list of the similes and allusions in the volume some of which do not exceed three or four in nearly as many hundred pages literary history does not record a more singular example of that self-delight which an author has left on a revision of his works it was this intense pleasure which produced his voluminous labors it must be confessed there are readers deficient in that sort of genius which makes the mind of richardson so fertile and prodigal end of section eighteen recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section nineteen of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli influence of a name what's in a name that which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet names by an involuntary suggestion produce an extraordinary illusion favor or disappointment has been often conceded as the name of the claimant has affected us and the accidental affinity or coincidence of a name connected with ridicule or hatred with pleasure or disgust has operated like magic but the facts connected with this subject will show how this prejudice has branched out footnote lower's english surnames an essay on family nomenclature may be profitably studied in connection with this curious subject End of footnote. stern has touched on this unreasonable propensity of judging by names in his humorous account of the elder mr shandy's system of christian names and wilkes has expressed in boswell's life of johnson all the influence of baptismal names even in matters of poetry he said the last city poet was elkanah settle there's something in names which one cannot help feeling now elkanah settle sounds so queer who can expect much from that name we should have no hesitation to give it for john dryden in preference to elkanah settle from the names only without knowing their different merits a lively critic noticing some american poets says there is or was a mr dwight who wrote a poem in the shape of an epic and his baptismal name was timothy and involuntarily we infer the sort of epic that a timothy must write stern humorously exhorts all godfathers not to nicodemus a man into nothing 
there is more truth in this observation than some may be inclined to allow and that it affects mankind strongly all ages and all climates may be called on to testify even in the barbarous age of louis eleven they felt a delicacy respecting names which produced an ordinance from his majesty the king's barber was named olivier le diable at first the king allowed him to get rid of the offensive part by changing it to le malin but the improvement was not happy and for a third time he was called le mauvais even this did not answer his purpose and as he was a great racer he finally had his majesty ordinance to be called le dain under penalty of law if any one should call him le diable le malin or le mauvais according to platina sergius the second was the first pope who changed his name in ascending the papal throne because his proper name was hogsmouth very unsuitable with the pomp of the tiara the ancients felt the same fastidiousness and among the romans those who were called to the equestrian order having low and vulgar names were new named on the occasion lest the former one should disgrace the dignity footnote fortunate names the bona nomina of cicero were chiefly selected in accordance with the classic maxim bonum nomen bonum omen End of footnote when berlier a french wit was chosen for the preceptor of colbert's son he felt his name was so uncongenial to his new profession that he assumed the more splendid one of docour by which he is now known madame gomez had married a person named bonhomme but she would never exchange her nobler spanish name to prefix her married one to her romances which indicated too much of meek humility guet a beggar is a french writer of great pomp of style but he felt such extreme delicacy at so low a name that to give some authority to the splendour of his diction he assumed the name of his estate and is well known as balzac a french poet of the name of theophile viau finding that his surname pronounced like vaux calf exposed him to the infinite jests of the minor wits silently dropped it by retaining the more poetical appellation of theophile various literary artifices have been employed by some who still preserving a natural attachment to the names of their fathers yet blushing at the same time for their meanness have in their latin works attempted to obviate the ridicule which they provoked one gaucher left-handed borrowed the name of scavola because scavola having burnt his right arm became consequently left-handed thus also one de la borgne one-eyed called himself strabo de charpentier took that of fabricius de valet translated his servilius and an unlucky gentleman who bore the name of du boudum boldly assumed that of virilus dorat a french poet had for his real name disnemandi which in the dialect of the Limousin signifies one who dines in the morning that is who has no other dinner than his breakfast this degrading name he changed to dorat or gilded a nickname which one of his ancestors had borne for his fair tresses but by changing his name his feelings were not entirely quieted for unfortunately his daughter cherished an invincible passion for a learned man who unluckily was named goulou that is a shark as gluttonous as a shark miss disnemandi felt naturally a strong attraction for a, a goulou and in spite of her father's remonstrances she once more renewed his sorrows in this alliance there are unfortunate names which are very injurious to the cause in which they are engaged for instance the long parliament in cromwell's time called by derision the rump was headed by one barebones a leather seller it was afterwards called by his unlucky name which served to heighten the ridicule cast over it by the nation formerly a custom prevailed with learned men to change their names they showed at once their contempt for vulgar denominations and their ingenious 
erudition they christened themselves with latin and greek this disguising of names came at length to be considered to have a political tendency and so much alarmed pope paul the second that he imprisoned several persons for their using certain affected names and some indeed which they could not give a reason why they assumed desiderius erasmus was a name formed out of his family name gerard which in dutch signifies amiable or gar all aired nature he first changed it to a latin word of much the same signification desiderius which afterwards he refined into the greek erasmus by which name he is now known the celebrated reuchlin which in german signifies smoke considered it more dignified to smoke in greek by the name of capnio an italian physician of the name of senza malizia prided himself as much on his translating it into the greek akakia as on the works which he published under that name one of the most amiable of the reformers was originally named hertz schwartz black earth which he elegantly turned into the greek name melanchthon the vulgar name of a great italian poet was trapasso but when the learned gravius resolved to devote the youth to the muses he gave him a mellifluous name which they have long known and cherished metastasio harsh names will have in spite of all our philosophy a painful and ludicrous effect on our ears and our associations it is vexatious that the softness of delicious vowels or the wreckedness of inexorable consonants should at all be connected with a man's happiness or even have an influence on his fortune the actor macklin was softened down by taking in the first and last syllables of the name of mclaughlin as malloch was polished to malay and even our sublime milton in a moment of humour and hatred to the scots condescends to insinuate that their barbarous names are symbolical of their natures and from a man of the name of mac Colkittock, he expects no mercy virgil when young formed a design of a national poem but was soon discouraged from proceeding merely by the roughness and asperity of the old roman names such as decius mus the sumo wibius saudex the same thing has happened to a friend who began an epic on the subject of drake's discoveries the name of the hero often will produce a ludicrous effect but one of the most unlucky of his chief heroes must be thomas doughty one of blackmore's chief heroes in his alfred is named gunter a printer's erratum might have been fatal to all his heroism as it is he makes a sorry appearance metastasio found himself in the same situation in one of his letters he writes the title of my new opera is il re pastor the chief incident is the restitution of the kingdom of sidon to the lawful heir a prince with such a hypochondriac name that he would have disgraced the title page of any piece who would have been able to bear an opera entitled labdolanimo i have contrived to name him as seldom as possible so true is it as the caustic boileau exclaims of an epic poet of his days who had shown some dexterity in cacophony when he chose his hero oh le plaisant projet d'un poète ignorant qui de temps de hero va choisir childebrand dans ce nom quelquefois le son dur est bizarre bon d'un poème entier ou burlesque ou barbare art poétique quinto trois vers deux cent quarante et un in such a crowd the poet were to blame to choose king chilperic for his hero's name sir w soames this epic poet perceiving the town joined in the severe raillery of the poet published a long defence of his hero's name but the town was inexorable and the epic poet afterwards changed childebrand's name to charles martel which probably was discovered to have something more humane 
Corneille's Partherite was an unsuccessful tragedy, and Voltaire deduces its ill fortune partly from its barbarous names, such as Garibald and Edvige. Voltaire, in giving the names of the founders of Helvetic freedom, says the difficulty of pronouncing these respectable names is injurious to their celebrity. They are Melchthal, Stauffarcher, and Walther first we almost hesitate to credit what we know to be true that the length or the shortness of a name can seriously influence the mind but history records many facts of this nature some nations have long cherished a feeling that there is a certain elevation or abasement in proper names montaigne on this subject says a gentleman one of my neighbours in overvaluing the excellences of old times never omitted noticing the pride and magnificence of the names of the nobility of those days don grumadan quadragon argesilon when fully sounded were evidently men of another stamp than peter giles and michael what could be hoped for from the names of ebenezer malachi and methuselah the spaniards have long been known for cherishing a passion for dignified names and are marvellously affected by long and voluminous ones to enlarge them they often add the places of their residence we ourselves seem affected by triple names and the authors of certain periodical publications always assume for their nom de guerre a triple name which doubtless raises them much higher in their readers esteem than a mere christian and surname many spaniards have given themselves names from some remarkable incident in their lives one took the name of the royal transport for having conducted the infanta in italy or in days added de la paz for having signed the peace in seventeen twenty five navarro after a naval battle off toulon added la vittoria though he had remained in safety at cadiz while the french admiral le Cour had fought the battle which was entirely in favour of the english a favourite of the king of spain a great genius and the friend of farinelli who had sprung from a very obscure origin to express his contempt of these empty and haughty names assumed when called to the administration that of the marquis of la ensenada nothing in himself but the influence of long names is of very ancient standing lucian notices one simon who coming to a great fortune aggrandized his name to simonides diocletian had once been plain diocles before he was emperor when bruna became queen of france it was thought proper to convey some of the regal pomp in her name by calling her bruna haute the spaniards then must feel a most singular contempt for a very short name and on this subject fuller has recorded a pleasant fact an opulent citizen of the name of john cutts what name can be more unluckily short was ordered by elizabeth to receive the spanish ambassador but the latter complained grievously and thought he was disparaged by the shortness of his name he imagined that a man bearing a monosyllabic name could never in the great alphabet of civil life have performed anything great or honourable but when he found that honest john cutts displayed a hospitality which had nothing monosyllabic in it he groaned only at the utterance of the name of his host there are names indeed which in the social circle will in spite of all due gravity awaken a harmless smile and shenstone solemnly thanked god that his name was not liable to a pun there are some names which excite horror such as mr stabback others contempt as mr twopenny and others of vulgar or absurd signification subject too often to the insolence of domestic whittlings which occasions irritation even in the minds of worthy but suffering men there is an association of pleasing ideas with certain names and in the literary world they produce a fine effect bloomfield is a name apt and fortunate for a rustic bard as florian seems to describe his sweet and flowery style dr parr derived his first acquaintance with the late mr homer from the aptness of his name associating with his pursuits 
our writers of romances and novels are initiated into all the arcana of names which cost them many painful inventions it is recorded of one of the old spanish writers of romance that he was for many days at a loss to coin a fit name for one of his giants he wished to hammer out one equal in magnitude to the person he conceived in imagination and in the haughty and lofty name of traquitantos he thought he had succeeded richardson the great father of our novelists appears to have considered the name of sir charles grandison as perfect as his character for his heroine writes you know his noble name my lucy he felt the same for his clementina for miss byron writes ah lucy what a pretty name is clementina we experience a certain tenderness for names and persons of refined imaginations are fond to give affectionate or lively epithets to things and persons they love petrarch would call one friend lellis and another socrates as descriptive of their character in our own country formerly the ladies appear to have been equally sensible to poetical or elegant names such as alicia cilicia diana helena etc spenser the poet gave to his two sons two names of this kind he called one sylvanus from the woody kilcolman his estate and the other peregrine from his having been born in a strange place and his mother then travelling the fair eloisa gave the whimsical name of astrolabus to her boy it bore some reference to the stars as her own to the sun whether this name of astrolabus had any scientific influence over the sun i know not but i have no doubt that whimsical names may have a great influence over our characters the practice of romantic names among persons even of the lowest orders of society has become a very general evil and doubtless many unfortunate beauties of the names of clarissa and eloisa might have escaped under the less dangerous appellatives of elizabeth or deborah i know a person who has not passed his life without some inconvenience from his name mean talents and violent passions not according with antoninus and a certain writer of verses might have been no versifier unless a lover of the true falernian had it not been for his namesake horace the americans by assuming roman names produce ludicrous associations romulus higgs and junius brutus booth there was more sense when the foundling hospital was first instituted in baptizing the most robust boys designed for the sea service by the names of drake norris or blake after our famous admirals it is no trifling misfortune in life to bear an illustrious name and in an author it is peculiarly severe a history now by a mr hume or a poem by a mr pope would be examined with different eyes than had they borne any other name the relative of a great author should endeavour not to be an author thomas cornille had the unfortunate honour of being brother to a great poet and his own merits have been considerably injured by the involuntary comparison the son of racine has written with an amenity not unworthy of his celebrated father amiable and candid he had his portrait painted with the works of his father in his hand and his eye fixed on this verse from phedra et moi fils inconnu dans si glorieux père but even his modesty only served to wet the dart of epigram it was once bitterly said of the son of an eminent literary character he tries to write because his father writ and shows himself a bastard by his wit amongst some of the disagreeable consequences attending some names is when they are unluckily adapted to an uncommon rhyme how can any man defend himself from this malicious ingenuity of wit Frere, one of those unfortunate victims to boileau's verse is said not to have been deficient in the decorum of his manners and he complained that he was represented as a drunkard merely because his name rhymed to cabaret murphy no doubt felicitated himself in his literary quarrel with dr franklin the poet and critical reviewer by adopting the singular rhyme of envy rankling to his rival's and critic's name 
superstition has interfered even in the choice of names and this solemn folly has received the name of a science called onomantia of which the superstitious ancients discovered a hundred foolish mysteries they cast up the numeral letters of names and achilles was therefore fated to vanquish hector from the numeral letters in his name amounting to a higher number than his rivals they made many whimsical divisions and subdivisions of names to prove them lucky or unlucky but these follies are not those that i am now treating on some names have been considered as more auspicious than others cicero informs us that when the romans raised troops they were anxious that the name of the first soldier who enlisted should be one of good augury when the censors numbered the citizens they always began by a fortunate name such as salvius valerius a person of the name of regilianus was chosen emperor merely from the royal sound of his name and jovian was elected because his name approached nearest to the beloved one of the philosophic julian this fanciful superstition was even carried so far that some were considered as auspicious and others as unfortunate the superstitious believe in auspicious names was so strong that caesar in his african expedition gave a command to an obscure and distant relative of the scipios to please the popular prejudice that the scipios were invincible in africa suetonius observes that all those of the family of caesar who bore the surname of caius perished by the sword the emperor severus consoled himself for the licentious life of his empress julia from the fatality attending those of her name this strange prejudice of lucky and unlucky names prevailed in modern europe the successor of adrian VI, as guicciardini tells us wished to preserve his own name on the papal throne but he gave up the wish when the conclave of cardinals used the powerful argument that all the popes who had preserved their own names had died in the first year of their pontificates cardinal marcel servin who preserved his name when elected pope died on the twentieth day of his pontificate and this confirmed this superstitious opinion la motte le Valle gravely asserts that all the queens of naples of the name of joan and the kings of scotland of the name of james have been unfortunate and we have formal treatises of the fatality of christian names it is a vulgar notion that every female of the name of agnes is fated to become mad every nation has some names labouring with this popular prejudice herrera the spanish historian records an anecdote in which the choice of a queen entirely arose from her name when two french ambassadors negotiated a marriage between one of the spanish princesses and louis viii the names of the royal females were uraca and blanche the former was the elder and the more beautiful and intended by the spanish court for the french monarch but they resolutely preferred blanche observing that the name of uraca would never do and for the sake of a more mellifluous sound they carried off exulting in their own discerning ears the happier named but less beautiful princess there are names indeed which are painful to the feelings from the associations of our passions Footnote plautus thought it quite enough to damn a man that he bore the name of lyca which is said to signify a greedy wolf and livy calls the name atreus umber abominandi ominous nomen a name of horrible portent nares heraldic anomalies in the footnote i have seen the christian name of a gentleman the victim of the caprice of his godfather who is called blast us godly which were he designed for a bishop must irritate religious feelings i am not surprised that one of the spanish monarchs refused to employ a sound catholic for his secretary because his name martin lutero had an affinity to the name of the reformer mr rose has recently informed us that an architect called malacarne who i believe had nothing against him but his name was lately deprived of his place as principal architect by the austrian government let us hope not for his unlucky name though that government according to mr rose acts on capricious principles the fondness which some have felt to perpetuate their names when their race has fallen extinct is well known and a fortune has then been bestowed for a change of name but the affection for names has gone even farther a similitude of names camden 
observes doth kindle sparks of love and liking among mere strangers i have observed the great pleasure of persons with uncommon names meeting with another of the same name an instant relationship appears to take place and i have known that fortunes have been bequeathed for namesakes an ornamental manufacturer who bears a name which he supposes to be very uncommon having executed an order for a gentleman of the same name refused to send his bill never having met with the like preferring to payment the honour of serving him for name's sake among the greeks and the romans beautiful and significant names were studied the sublime plato himself has noticed the present topic his visionary ear was sensible to the delicacy of a name and his exalted fancy was delighted with beautiful names as well as every other species of beauty in his cratylus he is solicitous that persons should have happy harmonious and attractive names according to aulus gellius the athenians enacted by a public decree that no slave should ever bear the consecrated names of their two youthful patriots harmodius and aristogiton names which had been devoted to the liberties of their country they considered would be contaminated by servitude the ancient romans decreed that the surnames of infamous patricians should not be borne by any other patrician of that family that their very names might be degraded and expire with them eutropius gives a pleasing proof of national friendships being cemented by a name by a treaty of peace between the romans and the sabines they agreed to melt the two nations into one mass that they should bear their names conjointly the roman should add his to the sabine and the sabine take a roman name footnote the names adopted by the romans were very significant the gnomon was indicative of the branch of the family distinguished by the cognomen while the prenomen was invented to distinguish one from the rest thus a man of family had three names and even a fourth was added when it was won by great deeds End of footnote the ancients named both persons and things from some event or other circumstance connected with the object they were to name chance fancy superstition fondness and piety have invented names it was a common and whimsical custom among the ancients observes larcher to give as nicknames the letters of the alphabet thus a lame girl was called lambda on account of the resemblance which her lameness made her bear to the letter lambda or lambda aesop was called theta by his master from his superior acuteness another was called beta from his love of beet it was thus scarron with infinite good temper alluded to his zigzag body by comparing himself to the letter s or z the learned calmet also notices among the hebrews nicknames and names of raillery taken from defects of body or mind etc one is called nabal or fool another hamor the ass hagab the grasshopper etc women had frequently the names of animals as deborah the bee rachel the sheep others from their nature or other qualifications as tamar the palm tree hadassah the myrtle sarah the princess hannah the gracious the indians of north america employ sublime and picturesque names such are the great eagle the partridge dawn of the day great swift arrow path opener sun bright End of Section 19。Section 20 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Schmidt. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2 by isaac disraeli the jews of york among the most interesting passages of history are those in which we contemplate an oppressed yet sublime spirit agitated by the conflict of two terrific passions implacable hatred attempting a resolute vengeance while that vengeance though impotent with dignified and silent horror sinks into the last expression of despair in a degenerate nation we may on such rare occasions discover among them a spirit superior to its companions and its fortune in the ancient and modern history of the jews we may find two kindred examples i refer the reader for the more ancient narrative to the second book of maccabees 
Chapter 14, verse 37. No feeble and unaffecting painting is presented in the simplicity of the original. I proceed to relate the narrative of the Jews of York. When Richard I ascended the throne, the Jews, to conciliate the royal protection, brought their tributes. Many had hastened from remote parts of England, and appearing at Westminster, the court and the mob imagined that they had leagued to bewitch his majesty. An edict was issued to forbid their presence at the coronation, but several, whose curiosity was greater than their prudence, conceived that they might pass unobserved among the crowd, and ventured to insinuate themselves into the abbey. Probably their voice and their visage alike betrayed them, for they were soon discovered. They flew diversely in great consternation, while many were dragged out with little remains of life. A rumor spread rapidly through the city that in honor of the festival the Jews were to be massacred. The populace, at once eager of royalty and riot, pillaged and burnt their houses and murdered the devoted Jews. Benedict, a Jew of York, to save his life, received baptism, and returning to that city with his friend Josinus, the most opulent of the Jews, died of his wounds. Josinus and his servants narrated the late tragic circumstances to their neighbors, but where they hoped to move sympathy, they excited rage. The people at York soon gathered to imitate the people at London, and their first assault was on the house of the late Benedict, which, having some strength and magnitude, contained his family and friends, who found their graves in its ruins. The alarmed Jews hastened to Josinus, who conducted them to the governor of York Castle, and prevailed on him to afford them an asylum for their persons and effects. In the meanwhile, their habitations were leveled, and the owners murdered, except a few unresisting beings who, unmanly in sustaining honor, were adapted to receive baptism. The castle had sufficient strength for their defense, but a suspicion arising that the governor, who oft went out, intended to betray them, they one day refused him entrance. He complained to the sheriff of the county, and the chiefs of the violent party, who stood deeply indebted to the Jews, uniting with him, orders were issued to attack the castle. The cruel multitude, united with the soldiery, felt such a desire of slaughtering those they intended to despoil, that the sheriff, repenting of the order, revoked it, but in vain. Fanaticism and robbery once set loose, will satiate their appetency for blood and plunder. They solicited the aid of the superior citizens, who, perhaps not owing quite so much money to the Jews, humanely refused it, but having addressed the clergy, the barbarous clergy of those days, were by them animated, conducted, and blessed. The leader of this rabble was a canon regular, whose zeal was so fervent that he stood by them in his surplice, which he considered as a coat of mail, and reiteratedly exclaimed, Destroy the enemies of Jesus. This spiritual laconism invigorated the army of men, who perhaps wanted no other stimulative than the hope of obtaining the immense property of the besieged. It is related of this canon that every morning before he went to assist in battering the walls he swallowed a consecrated wafer. One day, having approached too near, defended as he conceived by his surplice, this church militant was crushed by a heavy fragment of the wall rolled from the battlement. But the avidity of certain plunder prevailed over any reflection which, on another occasion, the loss of so pious a leader might have raised. Their attacks continued till at length the Jews perceived they could hold out no longer, and a council was called to consider what remained to be done in the extremity of danger. Among the Jews, their elder rabbin was most respected. It had been customary with this people to invite for this place some foreigner, renowned among them for the depth of his learning and the sanctity of his manners. At this time the Aham, or elder rabbin, was a foreigner, who had been sent over to instruct them in their laws, and was a person, as we shall observe, of no ordinary qualifications. When the Jewish council was assembled, the Aham rose and addressed them in this manner. 
men of israel the god of our ancestors is omniscient and there is no one who can say why dost thou this this day he commands us to die for his law for that law which we have cherished from the first hour it was given which we have preserved pure throughout our captivity in all nations and which for the many consolations it has given us and the eternal hope it communicates can we do less than die posterity shall behold this book of truth sealed with our blood and our death while it displays our sincerity shall impart confidence to the wanderer of israel death is before our eyes and we have only to choose an honorable and easy one if we fall into the hands of our enemies which you know we cannot escape our death will be ignominious and cruel for these christians who picture the spirit of god in a dove and confide in the meek jesus are athirst for our blood and prowl around the castle like wolves it is therefore my advice that we elude their tortures that we ourselves should be our own executioners and that we voluntarily surrender our lives to our creator we trace the invisible jehovah in his acts god seems to call for us but let us not be unworthy of that call suicide on occasions like the present is both rational and lawful many examples are not wanting among our forefathers as i advise men of israel they have acted on similar occasions having said this the old man sat down and wept the assembly was divided in their opinions men of fortitude applauded its wisdom but the pusillanimous murmured that it was a dreadful counsel again the rabbin rose and spoke these few words in a firm and decisive tone my children since we are not unanimous in our opinions let those who do not approve of my advice depart from this assembly some departed but the greater number attached themselves to their venerable priest they now employed themselves in consuming their valuables by fire and every man fearful of trusting to the timid and irresolute hand of the women first destroyed his wife and children and then himself Josinus and the rabbin alone remained their lives were protracted to the last that they might see everything performed according to their orders Josinus, being the chief jew was distinguished by the last mark of human respect in receiving his death from the consecrated hand of the aged rabbin who immediately after performed the melancholy duty on himself all this was transacted in the depth of the night in the morning the walls of the castle were seen wrapped in flames and only a few miserable and pusillanimous beings unworthy of the sword were viewed on the battlements pointing to their extinct brethren when they opened the gates of the castle these men verified the prediction of their late rabbin for the multitude bursting through the solitary courts found themselves defrauded of their hopes and in a moment avenged themselves on the feeble wretches who knew not how to die with honor such is the narrative of the jews of york of whom the historian can only cursorily observe that five hundred destroyed themselves but it is the philosopher who inquires into the causes and the manner of these glorious suicides these are histories which meet only the eye of few yet they are infinitely more advantage than those which are read by every one we instruct ourselves in meditating on these scenes of heroic exertion and if by such histories we make but a slow progress in chronology our heart however expands with sentiment i admire not the stoicism of cato more than the fortitude of the rabbin or rather we should applaud that of the rabbin much more for cato was familiar with the animating visions of plato and was the associate of cicero and of caesar the rabbin had probably read only the pentateuch and mingled with companions of mean occupations and meaner minds cato was accustomed to the grandeur of the mistress of the universe and the rabbin to the littleness of a provincial town men like pictures may be placed in an obscure and unfavorable light but the finest picture 
in the unilluminated corner still remains the design and coloring of the master my rabbin is a companion for cato his history is a tale which cato's self had not disdained to hear pope end of section twenty section twenty one of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jason in panama curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli the sovereignty of the seas the sovereignty of the seas which foreigners dispute with us is as much a conquest as any one obtained on land it is gained and preserved by our cannon and the french who for ages past exclaim against what they call our tyranny are only hindered from becoming themselves universal tyrants over land and sea by that sovereignty of the seas without which great britain would cease to exist in a memoir of the french institute i read a bitter philippic against this sovereignty and a notice then adapted to a writer's purpose under bonaparte of two great works one by selden and the other by grotius on this subject the following is the historical anecdote useful to revive in sixteen thirty four a dispute arose between the english and dutch concerning the herring fishery upon the british coast the french and dutch had always persevered in declaring that the seas were perfectly free and grounded their reasons on a work of grotius so early as in sixteen o nine the great grotius had published his treatise of mar liberum in favour of the freedom of the seas and it is a curious fact that in sixteen eighteen selden had composed another treatise in defence of the king's dominion over the seas but which from accidents which are known was not published till the dispute revived the controversy selden in sixteen thirty six gave the world his mare clausum in answer to the mare liberum of grotius both these great men felt a mutual respect for each other they only knew the rivalry of genius as a matter of curious discussion and legal investigation the philosopher must incline to the arguments of selden who has proved by records the first occupancy of the english and the english dominion over the four seas to the utter exclusion of the french and dutch from fishing without our license he proves that our kings have always levied great sums without even the concurrence of their parliaments for the express purpose of defending this sovereignty at sea a copy of selden's work was placed in the council chest of the exchequer and in the court of admiralty as one of our most precious records the historical anecdote is finally closed by the dutch themselves who now agreed to acknowledge the english sovereignty in the seas and pay a tribute of thirty thousand pounds to the king of england for liberty to fish in the seas and consent to annual tributes that the dutch yielded to selden's arguments is a triumph we cannot venture to boast the ultima ratio regum prevailed and when we had destroyed their whole fishing fleet the affair appeared much clearer than in the ingenious volumes of grotius or selden another dutchman presented the states-general with a ponderous reply to selden's mar clausum but the wise sommelsteik advised the states to suppress the idle discussion observing that this affair must be decided by the sword and not by the pen it may be curious to add that as no prevailing or fashionable subject can be agitated but some idler must interfere to make it extravagant and very new so this grave subject did not want for something of this nature a learned italian i believe agreed with our author selden in general that the sea as well as the earth is subject to some states but he maintained that the dominion of the sea belonged to the genoese end of section twenty one